Welcome to Silver Oaks quarterly webinar. My name is Shannon King and I'm president, partner and chief compliance officer of Silver Oak. And with me today, as usual, is Jonathan Charlo, uh, partner and also our lead analyst. The webinar is scheduled to last approximately 45 to 60 minutes as uh, in the past. A copy of this will also be posted to the Silver Oak website within the next couple of days. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, I encourage you to reach out to your Silver Oak advisor. Um, if you're not working with Silver Oak, feel free to contact me directly at 952-896-5701. And uh, as usual, I want to thank Jonathan and John and the entire team that makes the webinar possible. There's a lot of uh, time and resources spent on putting the materials together. And I want to thank uh, the folks that help on the IT side as well. For compliance purposes, I need to note we will be discussing the overall markets in the economy during this webinar. In doing so, we're providing our interpretations and perspectives. You should not rely upon this information as fact when making investment decisions. Also, we will not be discussing specific Silver Oak portfolio performance as each of our clients' portfolios are customized. Nonetheless, by now, everybody should have received their quarterly uh, customized performance reports. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to your Silver Oak advisor if they haven't already contacted you. And lastly, past performance is no guarantee of future success. So with that, Jonathan, let's take a look at the agenda for today. And we'll start with the discussion around the economy and the dashboard. We'll go into a discussion on markets and then our outlook as we move forward, both on the economy and the markets. We'll provide a few Silver Oak updates, including information on our IQ's positions. We also wanted to touch at the end of the session today on tax updates, because uh, there's some important things that will be coming up here over the next 12 to 18 months. And then we have a few other miscellaneous reminders. And of course, if there are questions, uh, as I mentioned, feel free to reach out to your Silver Oak advisor. Uh, even if you have suggestions for future webinar topics, I would encourage you uh, to reach out to your Silver Oak advisor and share those with us. We're always looking for uh, topics of interest. But with that, let's start with the economy and the dashboard. So as most people probably know by now, we break the dashboard into four major components. The first is the economy. And what you're seeing here is in each column, it's a different quarter. So the quarter that's circled is the second quarter of 2024, i.e. the quarter we just finished. And we're seeing the economy is neutral. Um, if it were red, red shaded, it would be negative. A green shaded would be positive. And of course, the gray is the neutral. And we're projecting over the next couple of quarters, not much to change there. The next component of the dashboard are the credit markets. And same as the economy, it's currently neutral um, and no change expected going forward in the next couple of quarters. Valuations, uh, valuations continue to be high in the markets. Um, and what that means is that it's a negative impact on the dashboard. And that's why you're seeing that in red. And we're projecting that to stay consistent for the next couple of quarters as well. And then market sentiment has remained positive. And again, no change expected in the next quarter or two. Where does that put the overall composite? Well, the composite remains negative. Uh, we were expecting it would go, uh, go neutral, excuse me, this quarter, but it just barely missed the neutral camp. Um, so we do anticipate next quarter the composite will go neutral. Now, Jonathan, you and I were talking about this uh, earlier. As I look back over the last 12 to 18 months, the economy has been relatively strong. Um, I know it's weakening, but it's relatively strong. Um, and the markets certainly have been strong. 
yet our composite is showing it's negative overall. That doesn't really tell the whole story though if you just look at this single slide. What I would encourage people to focus on is this next slide. And what we're gonna see here is that the composite is still kind of in that general negative territory if you just look at the, the pure numbers, but it has bounced off the bottom of 2022 quite a lot. And so we're seeing that positive momentum. It's just the numbers aren't yet through the threshold to get us to the more positive territory. Jonathan, anything else here on the composite dashboard that you would want to point out? Uh, well, well, certainly we're we're very close. Uh, I do think we'll hit it in the third quarter. And you know, as you mentioned, economic numbers still come in pretty good. Now things have maybe slowed a little bit, um, but the economy seems to be fairly stable. And we'll we'll show that later as we go through the webinar. Yeah. And that's a great that's a great segue into the next slide, which we're going to start with looking at that economy component of the dashboard. And so the first component here that we're going to look at, and there's a lot of uh, subcomponents of this dashboard, but the first one we're going to look at is the ISM Manufacturing Index. Yeah, so uh, essentially it is um, just right around that neutral territory, had come down quite a bit. And again, that's why we're kind of at neutral. Um, so technically uh, last month, the manufacturing number did come down. Uh, so it is below 50 currently. Again, still bouncing up, but maybe in the short run has come down a little bit. And that 50 is a threshold because above 50 is kind of positive, below 50 is contraction. Yeah, and the interesting thing though is is this is from ISM. Uh, S&P does one as well. Their uh, composite uh, index last month actually went up a little bit. So there are going to be some differences. I would still characterize this as likely improving we're kind of coming off of that bottom how about unemployment so unemployment um you know is still fairly low um but you know i did show that the trend though has been up and um i know it's something you follow but there is kind of the sum rule um as it uh regard regarding kind of unemployment which is that if we see a half a percent increase in the unemployment rate over the prior 12 months average, that in the past has tended to suggest um, a recession was coming. Now, like a number of other factors, like the inversion of the yield curve, we've kind of seen that um, in the past. The SOM rule though, we're not quite there, but we're, we're almost there. And so if we did see unemployment, tick up another 0.1%, then the SOM rule would be in effect, which would be suggestive of, of a recession. And housing. Housing, you know, did definitely come down um, uh, due to high interest rates and, and technically in the last quarter have come down a little bit. The only thing I would mention though, um, is we should see improvements in this uh, further um once interest rates start coming down and right. that that certainly would help the economy just because there there's labor involved there's um just a lot of trades mm -hmm. that are involved in in building homes so let's transition from the economy to the credit markets um and again just as a reminder that component of the dashboard is also right now neutral Correct, and and the um, yield curve, um, again, being inverted currently, meaning that short-term rates are higher than long-term rates, is kind of the negative part that we've seen so far. And we are still inverted, and we have been, um, and we're kind of in extra innings, so to speak. In the yes. past, um, once the yield curve has been inverted, we have tended to see a recession by now, which we really don't see on the horizon at this point. So let's move to valuations. Well, before oh, that, let's talk right. about the, the other spread. part of the credit markets. This would be kind of the positive that's kind of making it neutral. 
which yeah. is that uh, essentially the the credit spreads have kind of come down. And so even though a lot of people have talked negatively about the economy, that suggests that there really isn't much stress in the mm -hmm. economy or in the financial markets. Uh, again, so this kind of is that other positive factor making credit uh, a neutral factor at this point. All right, so now let's talk about the valuations, which uh, the economy and the credit markets were neutral, but valuations we had indicated were negative. Yeah, and, and so one of the things, we'll talk about this later, um, is we do generally need to see earnings growth uh, get a bit better. We've seen it within technology, but not across other sectors, and we actually have a slide addressing that. And then the last component here on the dashboard, the sentiment, which numbers just, new data just came out today. Actually, new, to, new data came out today on a, a couple of different factors, but uh, the sentiment came out as well. You want to touch on that? Yeah, it, it, it's, it has initially come up, but more recent data has just come down a little bit. And um, that that's always been puzzling to people. We've shown slides that when it kind of comes, gets very negative, that's actually fairly bullish. We're probably in neutral territory from that standpoint. But the market itself has been the factor that has made it positive. So its increase off of the bottom in the fall of 2022 is that biggest factor uh, causing the sentiment part of uh, the dashboard to be positive. Yeah. And that's a very good point, Jonathan. I think it was maybe two or three quarters ago we had a slide. It was striking that when sentiment is low, the following performance is really good. And when sentiment is high, the future performance is not very good at all. It's, it's yep. And an, an interesting nuance, though, in these sentiment surveys is when asked about the economy, consumers are a little bit kind of more neutral. Mm -hmm. But then they ask them about the stock market, and they're more positive. Yes. And, and again, that is what uh, this measure is capturing in the dashboard. Got it. Well, let's transition off of the dashboard and these various kind of technical components into a discussion about markets and how have the markets been performing? So we'll start with the equity markets. And you're gonna see here for Q2, it was kind of mixed performance. Obviously, uh, US large cap stocks were up quite a bit, 4.3% for the quarter. Remember, these are quarterly numbers. Um, emerging markets were up even more. Um, and then kind of in that mid cap, small cap, those smaller companies, uh, not so strong in the second quarter. Year to date, everything's positive. Again, U.S. large caps obviously dominating uh, these numbers. Although I will mention the international stocks, they've done, I think, a lot better than most people would expect it. And, and they're doing it with a headwind, uh, i.e. the currency conversion. If currency, the dollar wasn't so strong, these numbers would be even more impressive. Now, there has been a shift. The, all the data in today's session is really as of 6.30, the close of the second quarter. But since then, there has been a shift in some of these trends. Um, so as you look back over the last year, even if you look back over the last 18 plus months, you will see U.S. large cap pretty much has outperformed everything. And within the large cap, or within all of the sectors really, growth has outperformed value. That's not so much the case since June 30th. Um, so since June 30th, or the beginning of the third quarter here, um, U.S. large cap growth is actually down about 4%, while U.S. large cap value is up about 3 So that's a you know, pretty dramatic shift in performance. And Large cap in general, if you blend those two together, is down slightly, while small cap is up about 9%. Um, now, we've had in the last, I don't know, couple years for sure, these 
periods where it looks like the market's going to rotate and it doesn't last. So whether this rotation is going to last longer than just over the last several weeks or not, we don't know. But there has definitely been a distinct shift here short term. But let's talk about what's happened here over the last, say, six months, um, year to date. We've got seven stocks that are driving the vast majority of the performance. So if we look at the second quarter, the top seven stocks or the magnificent or mag seven, as you might have heard, were up 17%. And if you take those out, um, the rest of the S&P was actually kind of flattish. Uh, on a year-to-date basis, uh, those top seven stocks are uh, almost up 40%, um, although the S&P X, those seven stocks, still having a good year, up about 9%. But if we look at uh, uh, essentially the start of 23 through June 30th, um, the S&P is up 22%, which is a nice return yeah, without those a, seven yeah, stocks. Yeah, that's a great return. But those seven stocks have, have almost tripled. Uh, yeah, during crazy. that year, it's it's a huge gap. Yeah. Now on the right side, um, that dark blue component uh, is earnings. Uh, in looking at the contribution of those top seven stocks, and so you can see that you know earnings growth is a good bit of that. And if we look at the rest of the S and P, you're going to see that blue line is pretty thin. Mm -hmm. And we're getting into this later talking about earnings and, and kind of that expectation. So we can arguably say that these technology stocks have had good performance mm -hmm. and likely driven a bit by good uh, company performance. Mm -hmm. But what I'll be interested in, we'll talk about this when we talk about earnings in more detail, but these seven are investing massive amounts of money in AI, billions and billions of dollars in a single year by a single company, um, whether the earnings come as a result of those investments, I think is what everybody's kind of questioning. Is, are those dollars well spent? As far as the bond market goes and some of the other uh, more miscellaneous asset classes, you can see here US bonds kind of break even for the quarter, global bonds actually down a bit. Um, and that has to do with the currency conversion. Commodities did well, predominantly driven off of, uh, of uh, precious and industrial metals. And then REITs were kind of break even. But for the year, actually, REITs are up um, almost 9%. Um, commodities up about 5 And again, the U.S. bond market's kind of in that break even area with global bonds getting hit by the, uh, the strong U.S. dollar. So let's talk about that growth value dynamic. Uh, I made reference to it a little bit earlier because if we look here, we can see growth pretty much is dominated, especially in that large cap category. But, um, you know, there may be that rotation. It, it could be. And, it, and again, a lot of this is due to technology, technology being the largest component um, within the large cap growth sector. And then as we look across mid cap and then small cap, it's pretty evident when you compare those small cap numbers on the right to the left side of the, of the page where there's large cap numbers that again, large caps pretty much dominated, but maybe we're at the beginning of a rotation. This is showing us the sector performance of the large cap market, the S&P 500. Um, so talk us through this. So if we look at the bottom half and look at the growth components, we, we have four major sectors. Um, one being healthcare was down, uh, but really the other sectors were up. And again, the top performing sector was technology. If we look at the top half, you're gonna see a lot of negatives in the quarter. And that again is why mid and small were, were likely down in the quarter, um, not as many technology companies um and and again value uh being hit right right so let's go to those magnificent seven or even broader based the technology stocks um so we can see here on the left for the first half of 2024 tech really drove it 
Um, I mean, we looked at the seven that were like crazy numbers, but technology as a whole was still significantly ahead of the S&P broad-based. Um, it is the fourth best first half of a year for technology stocks going back, what was it, 35 or 40 years. Um, so we'll see here where the 2024 line is shaded. Uh, that's the fourth best only uh, behind 98, 95, and 2023. Now, what's going to hold, you know, for the, the second half of the year for these technology stocks? Nobody really knows. Um, it's been a bit of a mixed bag. You can see 23 was a great, great year in the first half. And, you know, it was okay, second half. I mean, it wasn't negative. Um, whereas 95, we actually were down slightly. Let's go now to international. And what happened in the international markets for the quarter? You know, as you mentioned before, international did pretty well. I mean, all things considering with the dollar being being a headwind. Um, I, I think the, the big shift is really EM Asia uh, and China actually performed fairly well. We'll talk about this a little later, but it kind of looks like maybe China is stabilizing a bit. Um, seeing you know good growth in uh, India uh, in the middle Latin America uh, had a big downshift um, and that did affect kind of year-to-date numbers now it's not a huge part of the international market but that was kind of a, a big shift and then if we look to the right you'll see Japan is down for the quarter but it is still having a decent year and and what we're looking at is the Nikkei uh, during the quarter uh, kind of was approaching its old high. And so there can be a little bit of volatility, but in general, conditions in Japan have been favorable in, in the last year. And the old high was, I don't even know, was 20 years ago? 20, 25 years ago. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's been, a, it's been a long haul. Bonds. So here we say bonds had a mixed quarter. Um, so talk us through that one. So basically, you're going to see, you know, some negative sectors, some positive sectors. But if we look at the two on the far left, emerging market, uh, high yield, those are considered more credit oriented. Um, and we had mentioned in the dashboard that the credit side of, of the credit markets have actually been positive. And so if we kind of look at treasury on the far right, that's interest rate sensitive. And, and so anything that has a bit more interest rate sensitivity, um, you know, had a uh, more difficult uh, second quarter. And, and again, if we look at it on a year-to-date basis, very similar trends, but um, again, the magnitude is much greater. Excellent. So let's transition to our outlook. And we'll start with the economy. Um, and we'll start specifically with the U.S. economy. And, and really here, uh, both in the U.S. and in the international side, overall, there just hasn't been a lot of change since last quarter. I would say, you know, if anything, maybe the data is coming in more su supportive of interest rate cuts, uh, whether that actually happens in September. I think the odds are, uh, at least right now, favoring a September cut by the Fed. I personally don't think they will. Um, I think they're going to push it off later in the year, but um, very possible. I think that's what the market's anticipating. And from an international perspective, you already touched on it, Jonathan. Uh, Japan certainly a bright spot, uh, even though the market had a tougher quarter overall. It's been a bright spot, and hopefully we see some stabilization in, in China. Now, again, we mentioned there are some indicators out there that in the past would suggest a recession. We haven't seen it. We're not even close to it. And so what is going on? Uh, the economy certainly seems to be more stable in, in a high interest rate environment than many people thought it would be. And so here, if we look on the left, we're looking at just the interest rate exposure of U.S. consumers. Um, and, and what you're seeing really in the last uh, 20 years is um, that, that uh, their uh, exposure to debt essentially has come down. Think about 
we, we've seen a graying in America. Um, you know, so older people tend to own homes, mm -hmm. even if they have a mortgage, they uh, essentially refinanced during the pandemic and are sitting at really low rates. Um, with an older population, you don't have as much credit card debt outstanding. So that's been the bright spot in the economy. Now, certainly younger people, high interest rates have been an impact, but when you put the two together, mm -hmm. I think that's why we've just seen more stability. And then if we look at the right, we're just looking at, you know, company balance sheets are in pretty good shape. Many of them use the low interest rate environment uh, to essentially have low interest rates on, on their debt outstanding, and they kind of took out their maturities. So there's not a lot necessarily coming uh, due in the next couple of years. Now, we, we certainly know in the commercial real estate market there, there is some, but in general, um, even companies' exposure to interest rates is not what it was in the past. So, so let's talk about the impact rates have had on inflation um, and where we stand with regards to inflation. So if we look on the right and, and see the green shaded portion, that is really what um, the Fed was calling transitory. And so you can see the big buildup on the uh, left uh, part of the left chart. And then you can see on the far right, it's, you know, just it's there, but not quite as much really let's focus on the right side and that the green line that you are seeing kind of decline that's housing um, uh, shelter costs it's declining but you know it's kind of declining at a slow rate and then the purple color uh, within the red uh, circle you see it has actually been increasing that's the service um, mm -hmm. side of the economy and so those are uh, the two factors that have kind of held inflation up. So it hasn't declined maybe as fast as people Overall hoped. inflation. Right. Yeah. And, and so again, as you mentioned, um, for bond returns um, and interest rates, this is gonna be a major factor for the Fed. Um, I agree with you that the September rate cut is not certain because they wanna see a couple more months of data. And if it stalls out or even ticks up a little bit, and we've seen it bounce um, by month by month, I think they'll wait. Um, but ultimately, um, I think the Fed can lower rates. And once it does, um, certainly that will help other parts of the economy. Yeah. Now, I've always said, and we probably go back to webinars we've recorded several quarters ago, I personally think the Fed looks at unemployment as well because they have a dual mandate and i i don't know that they're going to act real aggressively until unemployment gets just a little bit higher maybe that four and a half percent or so range but uh but i guess it's anybody's guess i do think having said that the fed does have room to cut rates and, and I think as we look forward over the, whether it's the next three months or six months or 12 months, the direction of rates is way more likely to be on the downside than to be on the upside. Um, and, and why do we think that there is room on the downside? Well, if you look at this, the Fed funds rate over on the left, that yellow bar, I think it's yellow, I'm colorblind, but orange or yellow, yellow. It's yellow. yellow. Uh, that's the Fed's funds rate. The bar next to it, that's the PCE. Um, and it's at 2.6. Actually, the core CPE came in today. That was another data point released today. It came in right at 2.6 as well. Um, so there's a spread there between the Fed funds rate and that, that PCE number. Um, so I, I think that's giving the Fed some room to adjust interest rates. Um, and then at the far right, you'll see the spread there between the Fed funds rate and that CPE um, and the historical representation of that going back in history. So, I mean, it's getting at a, a pretty wide spot. Our market outlook as it relates to the equities. So we're gonna go back. We just talked about the economy, but as it relates to the equities, 
uh, I would not be surprised if we don't see a pullback or at least increased volatility. I think we said increased volatility last time. This time we're probably a little bit more, uh, I don't know about bearish because I, I don't think we're thinking of a massive pullback, but maybe a little bit bearish and thinking that there could be a temporary pullback in the markets. We've had a great run so far. Five 10% pullbacks are pretty normal entry year. Um, honestly, 15% pullbacks aren't all that unusual. Uh, and we just really haven't had that magnitude here recently. Uh, of course, a big driver of any kind of pullback will probably be what happens with a MAG-7, with those stocks that really have been driving the market uh, over the last six to, to 18 months. Geopolitical wild cards, I mean, earnings, we've got a lot of things here that could impact the outlook of equities. Um, certainly on the positive side, price momentum, right? Uh, there's been a strong movement of the markets up um, and that could continue. We may be in early stages of this multi-year AI technology trend. Uh, I think if that's the case, it's my earlier comment, earnings are gonna have to start coming in over the next couple of years, proving that those capital investments made sense because they're they're throwing billions of dollars at this AI thing. So let's touch on earnings, Jonathan, because that's such an important part of valuations. Yeah, absolutely. So on the, the, the slide where we talked about technology stocks, you know, they have been showing good earnings growth. The rest of the market, not so much. And so if we look within the, the circle, you'll see in 2023, earnings were kind of flat to down. Um, and the expectation in 2024 um, is an 11% increase. That would be off of some sales growth and operating margins kind of coming back. Um, and, and again, this is kind of what we saw last year outside of, of the technology area. Um, and again, 11% uh, is the expectation for this year. And that really starts this quarter going forward. Um, now we always know that expectations start higher in the beginning of the year <laughs> and then go down. This year, they haven't come down as much as we might have expected. So again, the next few quarters are going to be critical from an earnings perspective. And then based off of this 11% growth expectation, um, the, the expectation next year is for 15% earnings growth. And so again, with high valuations, we need to see earnings come through. Mm -hmm. And this is going to show the sector earnings heat map. Yeah, and, and so if we look at that, you're going to see at the top is, you know, tech. And it, it, you know, in 2023 was green in the third and fourth quarter when there were a lot of oranges um, in other sectors. And what you're going to see in general, if we look at the second quarter going through the rest of the year, is really not as much orange as we've seen. And it just kind of gets progressively more green as we go through the year. And, and part of that is a big expectations in the fourth quarter. But we need to start to see that trend this quarter into third quarter to have that confidence in the fourth quarter estimate. Well, you mentioned fourth quarter. There's something else happening in the fourth quarter. I, I can't even you imagine. can't what imagine what's happening in the fourth quarter? Yeah. <laughs> well, we couldn't go without uh, pointing out that regardless of of earnings and regardless of the credit markets, regardless of ISM and all these things that we've talked about, the real key to investing is to be invested, to stay invested. Uh, and, and I only mention this because again, the election's coming up. There's a lot of strong feelings people have, I think particularly this election cycle versus past election cycles. And I know a lot of people get in the mindset that, you know, if if my candidate doesn't win, the other candidate is going to cause chaos and the markets are going to crash. And and I'm saying this from both perspectives because I, I hear it from far left leaning and far right leaning clients. It, it really doesn't matter. This chart 
along with other charts that we've been showing over the last quarter or two, is just proof that regardless of who is in office, whether it's Democrat or Republican, the best strategy is to just stay invested. So let's talk about our market outlook for bonds. Um, and, and when we talk about bonds, we've already mentioned the fact that the Federal Reserve is likely to be lowering interest rates rather than raising interest rates. The timing of when they lower could be argued. The magnitude of how much they're going to lower maybe could be argued. But I, I think the general direction is downward at some point. Um, that is coming off of a period in which we had the Federal Reserve raising rates at a magnitude that really we hadn't seen in a long, long time, and certainly over a very short period of time. And that resulted in 2022, the bond market having the worst performance in recent history. And I think, you know, as people have experienced that over the last year or two, some are questioning, why do I own bonds? Why do they still play a part in my portfolio? And, and maybe even, why don't I just hold cash instead of bonds? So we want to talk about this. Um, and I'm going to start, Jonathan, with you explaining what the primary role or roles are for bonds. Well, there are really four primary roles. Um, so if we look uh, at the uh, outside circles, income, capital preservation, liquidity, and diversification. So let's hit income. Uh, bonds provide a nice yield. And we're going to talk about that the yield currently is actually very attractive. Um, they provide a diversification benefit. They are less volatile than stocks. And so adding bonds in a portfolio will lower the overall volatility of the portfolio, which I, I think for many people helps keep them invested. If they were in all stocks and dealt with that sort of massive volatility, think of 2008, think of 2020, or even uh, the first nine months of 2020-22, might have actually scared people out of their uh, long-term investments, um, which gets to the capital preservation side. Uh, up until 2022, it wasn't really until the early 80s that we saw bonds showing negative returns and so generally they do provide capital preservation and, and it, even even in the 80s i think it was only one or two years i mean yeah in a small negative returns yeah so it, it's been a very important part of, again lowering volatility of the portfolio but pervert, uh, preserving capital the reason that's important is for the liquidity so for many people, especially if you're retired, again, you need that income, but you might have an unexpected expense that comes up. And so if you're in all stocks and the market is down, then you essentially would have to sell that asset uh, at its low. But by having bonds in the portfolio, you have that cushion for those unexpected liquidity events that you might have. So here's a, a common question that I think investors are asking, and that is, okay, I, I understand that, but why do you think, or why do you even expect returns going forward to look any better than they have the last year or two? So to begin with, let's just talk about where we are currently with yields. And so if we look in the red circles, municipals and investment grade corporates right next to them, we're talking about five and a half to 6% yields. And, and if the diamond is the current yield across the different uh, classes of, of bonds, and then the um, uh, purple uh, line is essentially that 10 year average. So again, in 2022, we were at lows for yields. And then we saw the Federal Reserve have to raise interest rates rapidly. And those are the rates that we're currently getting in terms of the yield. The diamonds. The diamonds. And so they're very attractive. And again, on the left, the type of bonds that typically are in the bond funds that we hold, very nice yields. 
And there is a correlation between current yields and forward returns. So here what we're seeing is in the, the uh, I don't green. know green dots, green the dots. green dots, uh, those are the 2000s. Um, and then the orange dots are, I think they're orange, are the 2010s, um, you know, coming off of a period of really low interest rates. Obviously, we can see to the, to the right, back in the 70s and 80s and even the 90s, rates were even higher than they are today. The point being, if you're in that bottom left kind of quartile, yields start low, your five-year forward returns are low. As yields start higher, the five-year forward returns are higher. So a strong correlation between where you start in yields and what the next five-year returns look like. And I pointed this one out, this slide here, only because um, actually that circle should probably be a little bit further to the left because uh, what I was wanting to point out is that uh, dark line, uh, and help me with colors here, that dark line, what color is that? Black, whatever. I think it's black. Black, okay, and what's the yeah. other one? Green. Green, okay. Yeah. The, the spread between the dark, blackish, and the green line in let's say that 2018, 2020, that, that spread is really, really wide. Um, and that has to do with interest rates, right? Shifting. So we would expect now that we're on current yields that are much higher, that that return, that green line, which is the return line, to come up higher over the next five years. Now let's talk about sequencing of returns uh, because I hear a lot about this too. I hear, oh, well, if I look back at the last five years, bonds really haven't done much. Mostly it's driven off of the 2022 performance because we can see here the Barclays Ag in the top box in 2022 was down 13%. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so we started at a low interest rate. So then when interest rates went up in 2022, we had a big loss. And then in 2023, we did see, you know, returns come back again due to the change in yield. So about five and a half percent in 23. Yep. And then in 24, 25, 26, we just wanted to show you kind of the continuation of that 23. Uh, and then in 26, it assumes that interest rates actually come down a little bit. So you get a little positive return. So again, four years of really nice healthy returns after a really negative return but lo and behold when you annualize it it's 1.8 percent which is the starting rate yield of the ag in 2022 so so let me just because this can get confusing in 22 if we started with a ag yield of 1.8 percent we know 22 performance is negative 13. We know 23 performance was positive 5.5. The current yield, we're going to assume we come in at about 5%. We're going to assume next year, no interest rate reduction, so the same 5%. And then in 26, we're assuming a reduction of interest rates by about a half a percent. That gets us to 8% return for 2026. You annualize those five and you get to 1.8, which was the starting yield of the ag. That right? Correct. Okay. And I'd say this is pretty conservative because most people don't think it's going to be 2026 within when interest rates go down. They think it's going to be maybe later this year or 25. But we've been super conservative in this calculation. Yep, absolutely. So the second case we're showing is really kind of where we were last year. Um, uh, essentially, the yield has already come up. But in this case, with year one, we're saying that interest rates actually come down. So you get more than that yield. But then once you've had that kind of one-year bounce, your returns are going to be lower. Sure. So when you start with a high return, your re next year returns are likely lower. And so here, what we show is that in year two, your return is, you know, three and a half percent. And it just 
kind of continues for the next four years. But lo and behold, when you annualize that three and a half percent, but you started in year one with an 11% return, it, it, it comes still to a very close to the annualized yield that you started with. Or, yeah. So the yield at 4.85 equates to about the 4.96. And that's kind of where we are right now, 4.85%. Correct. So what's the argument, Jonathan? They, these are This is the bond ag index, so broad-based bonds, not cash, it's bonds. Why, if I'm looking at this and saying, oh, well, you're telling me I'm going to get about a 5% yield on my bonds, at least according to this, these assumptions, why don't I just stay in cash? Because cash right now is paying 5%, at least if you pick the right cash vehicle. Absolutely. And this is really uh, in example three where we kind of walk through that. The issue is that if rates are you know, at 4.85% today and likely to go down, you wanna lock that in. The problem with cash rates, and in this case, we're using a one month treasury, which has a 5.5% yield, is once the Fed starts to lower interest rates, those one month treasury yields will start to tick down. And so what you have is reinvestment risk. And so with this, what we're showing is essentially uh, in year one, a decrease in that Fed funds rate, lowering the one month treasury yield to 4%. And then in, in year two, again, another lowering. And then we're just basically saying it, it then flattens out at 3%, okay? But what that means then, when you look at it on an annualized basis over that five year period, you come in at 3.2% average yield during Got that it. entire so, time. So in this assumption set, cash is going to get you 3.2 over that five year on an annualized basis, bonds 5%. Whereas if we look at example two, if you locked in, you're going to get that yeah. yield and, and keep it. Exactly. Got it. So we were just talking about the lowering of interest rates. And as a matter of fact, if I go back to the slide, this is the top example here. Look in 2026, we assumed a rate of return of 8% because we said interest rates in 2026 would decrease in that particular example. Well, let's look here. If we have a 1% reduction in interest rates, the U.S. ag would actually go up 11%. So in our example, we used 8% because we assumed not quite a full 1% reduction in rates. But if there was a full 1%, which ultimately I think a lot of people believe is going to happen, you get an 11% total return in the U.S. ag. If you're in municipals with a 1% reduction in interest rates, it equates to a almost 10% total return in those bond positions. So what we really need is what we haven't seen the last two years. The last two years, we've seen rates go up. We really need to see rates stabilize and now go back down. Back to cash. Um, one point we wanted to make is, again, bonds do tend to outperform cash in certain periods. When do they tend to outperform cash? Well, when the federal funds rate is greater than inflation. We just looked at that a few slides ago. We are there. The Fed funds rate is currently greater than inflation. Also, bonds tend to outperform cash when the Fed starts lowering rates. We've talked about that several times here. The third scenario where bonds tend to outperform cash is when the yield curve normalizes. Right now, Jonathan, you mentioned we're inverted still, but hopefully, as the Fed lowers rates, we'll start getting normalization of the yield curve. That's another period in which bonds tend to outperform cash. So with that, let's go to our Silver Oak updates. Um, we are currently in the interviewing process for additional operations role. Real excited to, uh, to add that. It's a, it's a completely new position for the organization. Uh, knock on wood, we've had Nice, uh, uh, steady 
uh, personnel and actually across the entire organization, uh, but also within our operations group, we just want to bring a new person on to add to that team. As far as our IQs positions go, let's just get a very brief uh, update there. So obviously, um, growth has done the best on an absolute basis. Our funds have uh, held their own in this environment. You know, value, while its returns aren't as high as uh, the growth sector, I would characterize our managers as performing above average um, within value. Um, small cap's been a difficult place, and we've seen that with our managers. Um, as you mentioned, international returns have been good, um, and our managers have done well. Um, international small cap and emerging markets have been a little bit tougher, um, especially this year, um, uh, our emerging market managers might be down a little bit relative, but they also had a really good year last year. And then to close that out, uh, within fixed income, I think our credit and non-traditional bond managers have done exceptional yes. uh, in this period. Now, one of the things potentially with this rotation that we've seen um, since the beginning of July, we've actually seen interest rates come down a little bit. And so our um, total return funds have had a nice mini little bounce. Sure. Um, and they were the most hard hit, of course, yeah. uh, during 2022. So they have a bit more ground to make up. Got it. Well, let's transition now into our tax updates and a couple of other important reminders. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of the components of the sunsetting of TCJA, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. But I wanted to put this on everybody's radar. It's, it's still about 18 months away. But at the end of 2025, the TCJA is set to sunset. Um, unless Congress acts otherwise. So that's going to be uh, a big issue for Congress to face um, as we head into the new year and after the elections. If it is sunsetting or if it does sunset, uh, rates are going up. So the current rates are listed on the left side of this table. The sunsetted rates are listed at the right side. And you can see not only do the rates go up, uh, these are federal tax rates, but also the dollars to hit those rates goes down. So instead of 37% at $731,000 plus of income, you're at 39.6% at only $470,000 or so of income. These are joint. Uh, this is assuming joint. If we go here, we'll see the adjustment that would be made to capital gains. Um, standard deduction, that would decrease from the current level. Personal exemptions, those would get adjusted. Uh, there would be no SALT limitation. So a lot of people think, oh, that's great. There's no SALT limitation. So I can take as much state and local income tax uh, uh, deduction as I want. However, a lot of people are probably going to be uh, having the benefit of that offset by the fact that AMT is going to come back into play, alternative minimum tax. So I wouldn't get too excited about the SALT uh, limitation going away if the TCJA does sunset. Uh, another big one here, and there's a couple of small ones uh, that you know may or may not impact individuals, but another big one here with the TCJA is the estate tax impact, the exemption equivalent. Right now, you can pass away with $13.6 million per person and not pay any federal estate tax, which the federal estate tax, if you have more than that, is a massive tax. It's like 45% tax rate. Um, that 13.6 exemption is estimated to go down to about six and a half or $7 million. So that would be a, a big hit. And then outside of the TCJA sunsetting, uh, just recently, like last week, the IRS issued final regulations surrounding some items involving SECURE and SECURE 2.0. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through all of these in great detail uh, because most of these don't go into effect until next year, but we did want to bring everyone's attention to these if you've inherited an IRA in the last couple of years, you need to make note of this. 
okay? If you've inherited an IRA, you need to make note of some of these changes. Um, for next year, we'll have increased catch-up contributions, at least for those who are 60 to 63. If you're younger than that, you don't get any, any increased catch-up amounts. And for whatever reason, if you're older than that, you don't either. It's just that, <laughs> that kind of 60 to 63 time frame. Um, and then, of course, starting in 2026, uh, catch-up contribu contributions are going to be uh, made in, in Roth form. The last item I wanted to point out is ID.me. So this is on a completely different topic going a completely different direction, but super important because you're not going to believe this, Jonathan, but just this morning, I literally got an email from the Social Security Administration saying that I will no longer have access to my Social Security account on the normal Social Security site. Uh, I think it said at the end of this year, I'm just looking at the, the email right now, I think it said the end of this year, you have to have an ID.me account to access your Social Security site. And if you'll see here, down at the bottom left, you actually need ID.me for IRS site going forward. Um, so I would encourage everyone to go out and in the next several months, maybe by end of the year, get an ID.me account. It's pretty easy, but I say that with a little bit of hesitation. Here's the only hiccup with the ID.me account setup. You have to either verify yourself via facial recognition or via speaking with an IRS agent. So you go to ID.me, literally go out to the website and type in ID.me. You fill out all the personal data. You upload your driver's license to the website. And then you're given the choice to either do facial recognition or speak with an agent. I would highly recommend speaking with an agent. I've had several occurrences where the facial recognition process glitches and, and it can be a hassle. I've walked half a dozen, a dozen, maybe even two dozen clients through this process using the speak with an agent feature. And it literally takes two or three minutes for the agent to come on the video. And then literally 15 or 30 seconds for them to look at your driver's license you uploaded and look at the video with your face on it and approve the account being opened. Super easy process. Um, but, but again, I found that much, much easier than the facial recognition process. So with that, I will remind everyone on today's webinar, if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for future topics, to reach out to your Silver Oak advisor. If you're not working with an advisor, you can contact me directly at 952-896-5701. Otherwise, we appreciate everyone's participation and hope you have a great day. Thank you, everyone.